Okay. So California Master Beekeepers Program, you see the logo there. I also have the shirt here. Um, we're based out of UC Davis. That's where our headquarters are. We started in 2016 and um, we're technically part of UC ANR, which is University of California Agricultural and uh, Natural Resources. And as I mentioned, uh, we work with organizations all across the state. So a few interesting facts here, which will be applicable pretty soon. Uh, there are over 11,000 backyard and small scale beekeepers in California. There are over 35 plus established beekeeping associations. There's probably even more, but those are the ones that we have um, registered with us. Um, there's research being conducted at many of the UCs and also the Cal State universities. Uh, there's over 1,600 a species of native bees in California, and that's out of the 4,000 in the United States. So that means over 40% of all of the biological diversity of bees is found in California. Um, so that's that's pretty special, that's a lot. Uh, also, this number is pretty crazy, but many years in the past decade, we've seen around 50% annual colony loss, which is very high. And uh, many of that is due to uh, varroa mites and other pests and diseases. And, We'll be talking about the four Ps and learning about um, some of the reasons why that is so. And also the Apis mellifera, which is the common honeybee, uh, their genetic diversity in, in California is, and specifically Southern California actually, is the highest of anywhere else studied in the world actually. So there's a lot of hybridization. We heard, you may have heard about Africanized bees. And so these hybrids of Africanized bees and also other, um, subspecies of bees are highest in California, so that there's a lot of diversity. And um, in that diversity comes some subspecies that have really good resistance to certain pests and disease. Maybe they're super hygienic, but then they have some negative traits. Um, so all of these go to show that in California, there are large needs, big beekeeping industry, and they're very diverse. There's diversity in genetics, diversity in organizations, organizations in geography, and us as the California Master Beekeepers Program, we're trying to find the best practices being developed all across the state and share that with uh, each other so we can kind of uh, kind of leverage that diversity and all the different ways of doing things because there's never, almost never in beekeeping one right way to do things. As we all know, there's many different ways to do things. So um, instead of making things black and white, we wanna just provide an array of different tools and there are incorrect ways of doing things, but provide an array of tools that you can use in your beekeeping throughout our curriculum and throughout our programs. So the goal of our, pro, or our the California Master Beekeepers Program is to strengthen beekeeping um, through education and partnerships. So I mentioned we have a lot of partners and uh, the ed education component comes through the certification program and specifically through a lot of standard setting. So the certifications, there's standards, right? There's exams in there, um, there's a bar to meet and uh, we collaborate with educators like Janine in this call and Dick LaForge, which are running the, the course out of Cal Poly Humboldt um, and other educators and researchers all across the state in curriculum development committees to uh, set these new questions and set the new standards so um, you will get the best information as possible um, and the most up-to-date information. Building and serving community and education. So I'll move on now. Um, so some of our values, service, safety, inclusivity, respect, and principles. We want to make sure we're evidence-based. That's very important. Credible, trustworthy, ageographic. So we don't want to give information that's specific to Southern California, for example. We want to make sure it's applicable to everyone. Or if it's only for Southern California, we're going to, um, we're going to say that. And then also adaptable to changing needs. Okay, so our governing structure here is mainly run by volunteers. Uh, it's just Wendy and I uh, working with a, a wide variety of volunteers all across the state, mainly through Zoom, but we do try to get together when possible. Okay, so these are, most of these ways are ways that you can get involved. I'll be going through each of them. How do we really um, affect change and how do we get the information out and, and make the collaborations happen? There's these five different aspects to it. So there's direct education, which I think would be most applicable to people in this call. 
I'll be going over that pretty soon. Partner development, volunteer engagement, connecting entities, and then the certification program. That's also one that's applicable. So direct education. So uh, we started with uh, our director is actually Alina Nino, and she's the state agriculturalist uh, for UC ANR um, out of the Extension Center at UC Davis. And she developed around 60 hours of core curriculum that is offered online. And all these courses are online through Zoom. So if there is a specific uh, topic, like maybe pests and disease um, identification that you want to learn about, or maybe making mead, we have a wide variety of classes. You can go to our website. The link is going to be at the end of this presentation. And it's interspersed throughout the year. And you can check those out. Um, and if you, the cool thing is, is if you are taking the certification program, if you are pursuing one of the certifications, you have full access to all of the, um, the classes for free, the lectures. Um, and I should also note that a lot of the lectures are, this was a core curriculum, but a lot of them are also developed by volunteers across the state. So uh, for example, um, Making Meat, that was developed by Mark Carlson out of San Francisco. I think he just actually moved to around UC Davis, but uh, he, he teaches that. And so uh, it's kind of a community led teaching each other um, uh, kind of a program. And so the most of the classes are going to be posted in, the, posted in the next few days, or at least within the next week. Uh, so check the website under the lectures tab for that if you're interested. And all of those lectures have been recorded too. So if you become a camp member or if you want to take the certification program, you're going to have a ton of recordings you can watch. That's kind of in the center here uh, through YouTube. And there's also webinars. So webinars are a little bit different from lectures. That's on the right-hand side here. And those are guest speakers. So this is an example of the guest speaker right here, Dewey Karen, who wrote the Honeybee Biology book, one of the de facto beekeeping books. Uh, he gave a presentation on defensive honeybees this past year. That was a great presentation he gave. Um, so those are also opportunities to check out. Uh, we also do some youth classes. And if you're interested in, in teaching some youth classes at like a local elementary school or anything like that, please reach out to us because we have some resources. We'd love to support you in your educational endeavors. And um, it's great work. So we try to teach also when we have the time ourselves, but we, we support other organizations in teaching youth classes. Um, the website also uh, has resources on there, regardless if you're a member or not, you can go on there and there's pesticide information, there's beekeeping regulations uh, information on there. And a lot of this is also developed by committees of volunteers or informal committees of volunteers. We also have uh, tabling at events uh, around the state. That's always fun. Uh, this is on the right-hand side. There's Pete Pritcher from Mount Diablo Beekeeping Association. And so we also have social media. If you'd like to uh, be up to date, if you're on Instagram a lot, Facebook, I don't know how involved you are, but if you are, um, there's some humorous stuff we try to post. And of course, also the educational component. And then we also have our monthly newsletter. And this newsletter goes alongside a monthly video where we try to do interviews with uh, new research, uh, research that has been put out. So the researchers often discuss, or maybe it's um, like a satellite um, spotlight. So one of our partner organizations will talk about their work. We did that with Janine actually for this organization, I think two months ago. Uh, and then also you get beekeeping tips. And so you don't have to be a member to sign up for the newsletters for everyone. And if you want to get that, that's the uh, option is the uh, sign up is on the website. And also um, I'll put it in the chat after I finish when I finish this presentation. And so this is, this is a map of the partner organizations that we have across the state. And this list has grown a lot since I joined. Um, uh, let's see, I think it's four of them are new. And the last, we started 2016, the last few years, it keeps um, we're focusing on growing. And so all the resources from all these organizations are being shared, uh, which is great too for every everyone that becomes a member because you get access to all of that knowledge. So I mentioned at UCLA, um, 
Brewer Beekeepers is a student organization there that I was involved with that started the uh, project called Bruin Apiary. Bruin is like a small bear. It's the mascot of UCLA. Um, we started that project to build the hives. And on the top left, you can see the photo of the hives after they were built or installed, not really built. It's not much to build there. Um, and these are all actually on the roof. So at UCLA, it's very urban. It's hard to find any land that is out like in a natural space on campus that doesn't have red tape around it or isn't already hogged by the um, UCLA athletics or things like that. So to start out, we started on the roof, which is very urban, um, but it's better than nothing in terms of education. And um, so camp worked with us. You can see at the bottom of the screen, there were many, many um, hurdles to jump in terms of approvals from the legal department at UCLA, the financial um, approvals, and especially since it was students kind of driving it, um, you need to get credibility, but Kemp made it happen. So at the top right is their newest apiary. So the organization is, is running without our help in many ways now. Uh, and their newest apiary is in Santa Paula, which is uh, north of UCLA. Uh, and that is uh, on a ranch out there, sustainability ranch. So this is some of the logos of the organizations. There's also other collaborators we work with. Uh, so volunteerism is a, a big component of, of camp and, and the work we do. Um, so we, we measure the number of hours that volunteers um, donate. And really it's, it's if you wanna make a positive impact in your community, as I mentioned, there are templates we have and uh, resources being connected with. For example, if you're willing to be a mentor, uh, we have a mentorship map, which you'll see a little bit later. If you want to be a mentor, you can get yourself on this map and nearby um, residents may want to be your mentee. Um, so if you want some opportunities for volunteering or, or some structure to that, uh, we, we offer that. Uh, so now I'll talk a little bit about the certification program. Make sure what time it is. Okay. And uh, there's four different levels. The first level was actually just renamed. So I'll skip this before you get confused with the old title. Um, but basically when you register, mm. you gain access to a ton of support tools. So I already mentioned the classes, the recordings and the, the in-person classes, the live ones, they're not in-person, remote, but live classes you get to, um, access to, but you also get access to an orientation that we do every quarter. You get access to study guides for each of the levels. Um, there's also prep courses. So for example, at Cal Poly Humboldt, Janine and uh, Dick LaForge are running that course. Um, that course will prepare you for the lowest level, Honeybee Ambassador level, and possibly the other levels you need to check. But um, so you can get educated at the local level and then take this certification exam to study and push yourself to meet a certain bar to make sure that you are well-rounded in all of your knowledge. Um, and there are all, there's also an online course if you take the second level, apprentice level. I'll be going through the levels pretty shortly. So if you wanna take an online uh, course that is pretty interactive, I think it'll take four hours to complete. It took us two years to develop that course. You can self-teach that way. We also are aligning the curriculum with the Honey Bee Biology textbook. So if you want to learn from a textbook, you could do that as well. We have a study plan for you um, through the textbook method. And we also offer office hours and support sessions. And support sessions are Zoom meetings where if you don't have a local organization to go to, but it looks like you guys do, um, you can drop in and ask any questions that are beekeeping related to experts. And um, so that's really useful for people that are remote. But if you guys have like questions, you probably have an avenue to come and talk to ask questions at this club. So that would suffice. Um, and the mentorship network as well as another one that I mentioned earlier. Mm. So yeah, and then there's volunteer requirements to maintain the certification, uh, but that's kind of later, I'll skip that. Um, so the base level is the Honey Bee Ambassador level. So this is if you have no beekeeping experience at all and you want to learn the basics. And 
completing this level does not take you to the point where you can manage or start your own hives. It really is, you just know the basics of bee biology, you know, the basics of uh, uh, how to manage a hive, but not enough to really manage it yourself or set one up. Um, and so this is uh, pretty useful if you just want to learn the basics or really learn if beekeeping is right for you. And I'm guessing since most of the people in this call are in a beekeeping org, you're probably all pretty serious already. Um, but this might be useful to share with some relatives or some other people that just want to learn if, if beekeeping is right for them. And this level is, uh, is only $50 and we do offer scholarships as well. We try to make it, everything as accessible as financially possible. Um, uh, and so the exam for this, there's only a written component and you could take it anywhere from the safety of your own home. And uh, you take it online and you you get all the resources that I mentioned earlier to prepare for it. And you can take it anytime you're ready. The apprentice level is the next level and it's a really big jump up. So once you complete this level, you are considered a very well-rounded beekeeper that can strategize, you can manage pests and disease, you can start your own hives, you can uh, identify um, possible issues coming, you can plan. Um, so it's a big level, a big step up. And so there's two prerequisites to this course. You can choose from either. Either you had completed the previous level successfully, the Honeybee Ambassador, or you have already owned your own hives for a year. Um, so you could choose either of those, whatever fits your, if you already have hives, then you could just, for a year, you could just skip the previous level. You probably already know the basics. Um, and so, yeah, so th this exam is split into two components. There's a written exam, and then there's also an in-person exam. And that in-person exam can be done in different ways. You can go to um, a location uh, where you will be administered the exam by a proctor, or you can uh, actually take the exam via Zoom uh, at your own apiary or in any apiary that you're at. And Wendy or I will, will go over the exam rubric with you and we will test over Zoom. Uh, but you do have an exam offering location near you uh, that Janine and, and John offer that. So if you want to take the exam and you want to proctor to proctor for you, it's not too far for you if you live um, yeah, in Humboldt County. Next level is journey level. So if you want to become more advanced in the theoretical aspect of beekeeping, and so you'll, for example, you'll get to learn some Latin names in this level. You'll get to learn about how to do a proper honey tasting. Uh, you'll get to learn about how to test for nosema. So there's a higher level of pest and disease management that you'll learn. There's a higher level of honeybee tasting you'll learn. Um, and also, I should mention honey and hive products as well. So the apprentice level, the previous one, you'll learn how to extract honey. The journey level, you'll go further. farther. It's like, what are the best practices in, in um, harvesting uh, like propolis and things like that, which aren't as common, but um, you'll get to learn more about that. And the, the only way to take this level is if you completed the apprentice level. So there's only one option. The last level is the master level. Uh, so the master level is project-based. And this is where people have a lot of fun. A lot of people, at least in the time that I've been in this program, which has been almost a year now, um, really just wait to, to get to this level uh, because you, you get some one-on-one -on -one support from either our director, Alina Nino, which is like a top researcher in the state, if you, if you want to do your own beekeeping research, or if you want to do education and outreach, Wendy and I will help you develop your own curriculum. But basically, there's different tracks on what this project can be. And the tracks are listed here. So there's native bees and pollinator gardens. There's commercial beekeeping. There's scientific research. There's education and outreach. And there's policy for honeybees and native pollinators. So uh, there's a list of some of the projects have been done before. Uh, some interesting ones, uh, I think this, this past year, two people started their own business. One was the Bohemian Hives. Um, and so you could you can have some support in starting your own beekeeping business if that's something you're interested in. 
And the intention of this is to apply some of the knowledge you've learned or somehow create some templates or serve the community in some way. So for example, if you're starting your own business, um, there was some educational component to it that the one of the, the Bohemian Hive did. Another business, they uh, created some templates for other people who want to start their own business, like a little guide. So I talked a lot about commercial beekeeping and businesses, but there's also research if you want to do research. Um, someone in the Bay Area actually is uh, doing research on a subspecies of bees that was imported here from Brazil. It's not Melipona, it's a, it's a different one, I believe. And it was imported in the 70s and they thought it was it went extinct, but apparently it's still living in Palo Alto, which is around where, um, where Stanford is. And so recently some kid just found one of the, I can send an article if anybody's interested. Some kid found this bee that everybody thought was no longer in the Bay Area. Um, and, and so they're, they're want to do some research on the genetics of, of that bee. Um, and there's a few other listed there, but the master level is the highest you can attain. And once you're a master level beekeeper, um, you get access to everything indefinitely. And also um, we invite you to give uh, lectures as well, if you're interested in that. So a few other things that are being worked on, I mentioned the mentorship system we have on the right-hand side is a map. I think this photo is a little bit out of date, uh, but these are just some of the places where people have listed their contact information and they're willing to be mentors. Uh, we also are working on a requeeting protocol and diagnostic resources. And the online course that I mentioned earlier is actually going to go out for the first time this year. It was piloting the last year. And um, yeah, there's a few other items like PSAs on defensive bees. So this is the QR code. I'll also put the link to our website in the chat um, after I do the four P's presentation. This QR code will link to our website and the social media and the application for all the levels are open. They opened like three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Um, so if you're interested in that, check that out. And then also if you just wanna take any of the classes, um, that's, that's an option too under the lectures tab on our website. And also, if you want to do any educational project or want to volunteer, let us know. We'll connect you. So I could, um, Eric, what do you think? I could do some questions for this section first and then go on to the four Ps, or we could just do all the questions at the end. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Well, you can. Um, you guys could start putting questions in the chat. Let's just do all the question and answer at the end. Cool. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and Okay, so We'll move on from talking about camp and hopefully I've uh, talked about how we can support you in your beekeeping journey in camp onto the four Ps. And this is more of an educational presentation and it's going to talk about um, honeybee health and how this mnemonic, which is the four Ps, applies to honeybee health. And uh, so we won't be going too much into the di diagnostics of the pest and disease, for example, um, and the how to treat, but we're going to be talking about kind of how, how to, like what they are and the basics of that. Um, so what are the four Ps? So there's pathogens, pests, pasture, and pesticides. Uh, so pathogens are microorganisms that adversely affect bees. Uh, so that includes the bacteria, fungus, viruses, and microsporidian, which are like unicellular um, uh, like so, organisms. And the pests are, are larger, and we also lump um, we also lump like predators into pests as well. So that's part of it. And those include burrow mites, tracheal mites, small hive beetle, wax moths. We'll be going into each of these in a little bit more detail. And then we have pasture and pesticides. So pasture is the available food stores for bees and the diversity of it. Um, and pesticides are, are pesticides that negatively affect bees, I think, as we all know. 
And so for pasture and pesticides, those two I won't be going into as much detail later. So we'll talk a little bit more, more about them right now. Um, so pasture, it's been shown recently. Um, there's actually over the summer, there's a research paper published that having um, native plants, a diversity of native plants that produce phytochemicals. And phytochemicals are often just immune um, system compounds in plants. Having those plants, the diver diverse plants that uh, have strong immune systems actually support the immune systems of bees. So the a strong plant immune system translates not directly, but in, in, in some ways to a healthy, strong uh, honeybee immune system. So having native plants, having diversity of plants, having plants that are not treated with pesticides, um, in many cases will lead to stronger honeybee immune systems. Uh, because often pesticides, they do the work that a plant's immune system would have had to do. So the plant's immune system doesn't develop properly, doesn't produce all the chemicals that actually support the bees. Um, so pasture, make sure to have enough uh, nectar flow, and then make sure to have diversity in, in the types of flowers that you have and the stages at which they're growing. Pesticides, uh, there's this tool that I'll share with everyone here. It's, it's produced by UC IPM, and IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management. I'm pretty sure if you just search it up, it'll come up. If you search up UC IPM uh, Pesticide Diagnostics, uh, it will list all of the pesticides for specifically for honeybees, if you select the honeybees uh, that affect them and the different, how it affects them. And also if it will affect the honey and wax that you want to harvest as well, because sometimes it adversely affects the bees, but it doesn't affect the products that you want to take from it. And even if it does affect the product, sometimes many pesticides are designed to just break down under UV, actually. So if you just leave the materials out in the sun, it will break down to a level that's safe for humans. Um, and that's been proven and actually designed that way by the pesticide manufacturers. So with pesticides, you, you know, it's hard to tell sometimes if it's pesticides or if it's a disease of some sort. Um, but if you do uh, have a high feel like you feel like it might be pesticides, just make sure to capture some of the bees, um, like take a sample of them so you can send them to a lab. And uh, on our website, there's a, there's a few lab suggestions, I believe, on where to send them. Uh, but make sure to capture some right after the uh, supposed exposure. And mm, yeah, so for, for pesticides, uh, make sure to capture bees and uh, also make sure to check out that portal I mentioned uh, because uh, not all pesticides will affect the bees badly or you badly. Okay, so those two didn't have many slides, but we'll go on to the pathogens and pesticides. So we'll start with the pathogens. And the first type of pathogen we'll talk about is the bacterial pathogens. So this is the big bad guy. Uh, this is American fowl brood. So if you uh, find this, you detect this in your apiary, it is a big issue and you're going to, under California law, have to burn uh, your apiary fully and completely bury it or completely bury it. Um, and so it's the most serious bacterial disease of the honeybee uh, and is caused by the bacterium appendicillus larva. It's extremely contagious. That's why the California government makes sure that uh, under regulation, you have to completely destroy everything. There's no cure. Uh, is spore forming and it lasts a long time. So uh, you don't want to just abandon the hives because um, that transmission can still happen long after um, you, you, all the bees have died, essentially. Uh, so how does it transmit? It's, uh, it can move from frame to frame or from colony to colony. It can be done by drifting, so from one um, hive to another in your apiary. It could also be done by robbing, and robbing is when uh, a bee goes into another colony or um, or a pest or like some type of other pest goes into a colony, and uh, use of old equipment. So this goes to show why it's very important to always disinfect your equipment. So your hive tools, always disinfected with alcohol or some other disinfectant, but alcohol is fine. 
um, after every time you use it. And even when you're working in your own apiary, but especially if you're going to go to someone else's apiary. I know many people over the last year that have actually uh, just prohibited other people from bringing their tools to their apiary because they really don't want anything transmitted. So just make sure always to clean with alcohol. And wash your bee suit too. That, that's always good to do. Mm. So how do you uh, diagnose AFB? So there's a list of things on the screen here. Um, so the smell is very important. And it's usually pretty um, easy to identify from the smell. So it smells kind of like sulfur. And you're going to get scaling. Um, and also the color of the brood is going to be kind of coffee color. And if you put a toothpick in and you pull it out um, of the brood, the brood is going to be all mushed up. It's going to be very ropey. So it's going to like go beyond like two inches when you pull it out or one inch there. Um, and yeah, so the color of the brood is going to be chocolate and brown to black. And the cappings are going to be perforated. So we're going to have holes. And here's a photo that kind of shows it. Um, so you can see that some of them are perforated at the top left. So they have holes in them. You also see there's brown and black scales on the floor of cells. And those scales are like the body of the, the larva that had just been completely destroyed and it just flattens up and gets stuck to the bottom of the cell. So if you like use a toothpick and like move it around, you can kind of tell that. Um, and then uh, let's see anything else. There's also tests, of course, that you can buy to, to test it. But if you see any of these signs, you definitely want to immediately buy a test and um, not be using your tools anywhere else, even if you clean them. So it doesn't matter the time of year or the season. Um, AFP can hit at any time. And there's kits available that you can test with, as we mentioned. There's also the Holtz milk test, which I won't be going into too much detail, but you can see that in the center, that's the Holtz milk test, use milk. Um, and you can also send a sample to the USDA Beltsville lab. There's other labs too you can send it to. So it's always useful to know what healthy uh, brood patterns are and healthy bees look like when we're talking about pests and disease, especially if you're a beginning beekeeper. Uh, just seeing what healthy bees and, and brood look like is very important before you start your own apiary because you might not even know there's an issue based on visuals if you haven't already seen healthy, um, healthy bees. Uh, so how do you treat AFB? As I mentioned earlier, there's no known cure. So you need to burn all your equipment. It's a law in California. And uh, also it's recommended to reach out to your county ag commissioner. Um, and, and so notify them because then they could do contact tracing. As we know what contact tracing is with COVID, it's important to track where there are outbreaks. So um, they can act, the government can act properly. So there's something similar it's called European foul brood. It's not as serious as American foul brood, but it's still an issue. Um, and so it's highly contagious as well. And it affects larvae. Uh, they die when they're around four, four to five days old. And you can visually distinguish it from AFB. So you don't need to, it's not so similar to AFB that you need to send it to a lab, for example, to tell the difference. You can tell the difference visually. Mm, so this it can be transmitted the same way as uh, AFB. And so if you saw all of many of the symptoms of AFB, um, but it's not ropey, so when you put a toothpick in, you pull it out, it's probably AFB. It doesn't form spores. Um, and uh, the scale is brown to black at the bottom of the cell. It could easily be removed as well. Mm. And the appearance uh, of the larva is twisted, dull to yellow to dark brown. So there's also a, a test for uh, the European foul brood you can do. And this is how it looks like, somewhat similar to AFB. And so you can treat for EFB. It's, uh, it's somewhat of a stress disease. So what is a stress disease? Uh, some diseases, if you detect any amount of it, 
uh, like the AFB, that is basically a big issue for your hive and it, you need to do something. That's not a stress disease. A stress disease is a disease that once the, your hive is, your colony is unhealthy or it's weak, for example, doesn't have enough food, these diseases will naturally occur. Um, so another one is Varroa mite. Mm. So yeah, once you get honey flow, it's often uh, clears up. And there's also probiotics. So probiotics are like healthy bacterial cultures. You may have heard of it for humans too. It keeps your, your healthy gut. Those are helpful uh, for the bee's immune system. And how do you treat EFB? You can requeen. And there's also antibiotics available. Uh, many, many antibiotics in the state of California now are required to be prescribed. So you can't just go out and buy it. Uh, that's a law. So make sure to have a licensed provider if you're going to get some antibiotics. So we'll also go into fungal disease. Um, so Eric, until what time do I have? I don't. I want to make sure that I'm going at a good enough pace. Uh, yeah, you, you, you go. Okay. So we also have fungal diseases. Uh, so that's another type of um, microorganism, which is a pathogen. Uh, so one of them is chalk root. So it was first ID'd. It probably came a little bit earlier in the U.S. in 1965. Um, so the disease larva can be found on the outer edges of the brood nest, and the workers, drones, and queens are all susceptible. So it doesn't uh, target one uh, member of the cast, like for example, varroa mite does. So how does it transmit? It's caused by spore, uh, and the bees eat the spores along with the larval food, and the, the spores can germinate in the midgut, and adult bees um, often share food, so that's how it gets transmitted from bee to bee, and as with almost all the other diseases, beekeeping equipment also transmits. Uh, so how do you ID it? What's the diagnostic? You, the larva turns chalky white. So often like larva is like kind of supposed to be somewhat glistening, um, but it turns chalky white in this, in this case. And it may turn black and they become hard. And it's often found, usually get this in springtime and drone brood is more susceptible. Uh, so in the brood, it does uh, affect a certain type of uh, cast members more specifically, uh, but adult bees, it's, it's more evened out. Uh, and then the nurse bees will be, you'll be seeing the nurse bees going in and removing all of the mummies, which are the dead bees that have turned black and hard. You can see on the left-hand side what it looks like. On the right-hand side as well, all the nurse bees are moving the dead bodies outside of the hive. And so this is another, um, another disease where no, uh, no medical treatment is necessary. Um, and you can use a ventilation box, which would be useful to get rid of the spores. And uh, you might want to consider a new queen if the queen had been infected. That's, that, that's important. And also, there's different stock of, be of queens that produce different um, kind of genetic um, variations of, of honeybees, so you can get hygienic bees that are more hygienic. You might want to get that uh, because they can nip the disease sooner than later because they will be removing the diseased bees faster uh, before it could transmit. Uh, avoid transferring combs, rotate the old combs, and make sure your area is sunny so the spores can't uh, duplicate as easily. Uh, you can also improve their nutritional health so it's somewhat of a stress disease, as I mentioned earlier. So doing things like improving nutritional health will help the bees be able to improve their immune system and be more hygienic so that this disease doesn't get out of hand. Um, so pollen patties, you can use to feed the hive. Um, you can also use sugar syrup, and there's some supplements you can give as well, like honey bee health. So now we'll go on to pathogens, uh, viral. So viruses. So one virus that is known as sac brood, um, it's not very serious, so you don't have to uh, get all out of shape if you see it. Um, and it's most common in spring, so it is dependent on the season. 
So it's unknown how it spreads from nature to larva, uh, but uh, often severe outbreak happens because it's not linear. So if you let it get out of hand, it's going to get worse and worse, faster and faster in many cases. So you want to make sure that you're always checking on your hives uh, before it gets to a point where you have to uh, treat. Um, and also, uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. And also some of the symptoms that you can see. So the larva can be pale white. And also a uh, really big one is the dead larva look like a sack of fluid. And no control is necessary. Uh, if you need the queen is infected, you might have to requeen. So it's a stress disease that you don't really need to treat in many cases. Uh, so deformed wing virus is another one. This one, very easy to ID. You get the deformed wings. Um, and the bees don't live very long. So the, and then of course they get paralyzed as well. So their legs and wings will get um, paralyzed over time and you'll see them having erratic movements or trying to fly erratically. So there's no known treatment. Um, and just make sure you have good sanitation practices. You replace comb when infected. And um, there are some, uh, new treatments being developed right now, like RNA silencing technology, but none of them are like commercially available. Um, and so we will, so Nosema I mentioned a little bit earlier is, is um, microsporidian. So Nosema at the journey level, you'll learn how to test for Nosema. And so you need a microscope to be able to ID it. Um, and essentially you can see the, the spores there, yeah. And the transmission is, is done through fecal waste around the hive. And uh, you'll be able to tell if they have nosema from their inability to fly. And there's different types of control you can do. So you don't always have to use pesticides. This goes to the idea of IPM, which is integrated pest management. There's a pyramid, and you can always start with uh, non-invasive types of pest mitigation, like for example, if you have a, a predator, like a bear that wants to come eat, instead of like killing the bear with some pesticides, you would first put a fence, a mechanical barrier around um, your apiary. So that goes not just for bears, but goes for many other uh, pest diseases as well. Um, like cultural control is, is one of those. So varroa mites are the big one that everybody's probably heard of. Uh, so they actually, it's been proven that they don't suck on the hemolymph of the bee. They suck on the fat bodies on the abdomen of the bee. And it's a stress disease. So almost, I mean, most hives have some level of varomites. You just want to test. You want to make sure that the percentage is not above 3%. And when I say 3%, that means three bees per, or three varomites per 100 bees. Um, and there's different ways to test that. I'll talk about one of them pretty soon. And yeah, you just don't want it to let it get out of control. Looks like a tick. And I'll go to um, the, some of the symptoms here. So the bees are gonna be smaller. They're gonna have crumpled or disjointed wings. They're gonna have shortened abdomens and their lifespan is also shorter. And the best way to just ID it is honestly just, if you have good enough eyesight uh, or magnifying glass, just ID, you can see the varroa mites on the bee. Uh, there's many different ways to treat varroa mites. A uh, very good resource is the Honey Bee Health Coalition, which gathers a lot of research and, and surveys beekeepers every year on the best ways to mitigate for varroa mites. And so this manual they produce every year is used by many beekeepers. I highly suggest you check it out. And they have uh, great videos on the different techniques. And that's linked on our website. So one of the common techniques I'll mention to uh, get the percentage of varroa mites, that is a sugar shake. So you basically want to remove the varroa mites from the bee's body. So you just put the bees in a jar, you put powdered sugar in there, you shake it up and the sugar um, removes the adhesive ability of the varroa mite to kind of hold on to the bee. And so you shake all the varroa mites out and then you count the number of varroa mites. And 
Do you know the number of bees that went in approximately if you measured them properly? So you could do the calculation, the number of mites divided by the number of bees, which is greater than 3%. And that percent varies throughout the year, but for most hives, three per, above 3% is an issue. I'll also talk a little bit about uh, small hive beetles. So that's another one. This is what it looks like. Uh, they don't get too large, it's about one fourth of an inch in length. And you can see them running around when you open the hive at the top. So you, you should be able to ID them. Uh, they're larger than varroa mites. Um, they have three pairs of legs. And um, you can see the, the larva on the right hand side. And this is them, how you, they would look on the top of the hive. They're a lot larger than varroa mites and they won't be like on top of the bees commonly. So you wanna prevent them. So just, it's another stress disease to make sure the colony is healthy and strong. Keep the hive in the sun. You don't want it to get moldy in there, or like allow a lot of moisture to get into the wood and always keep the bottom board uh, clear of debris. Three. So I mentioned earlier, you don't have to start with pesticides. This is one of those cases where you can use mechanical control to uh, trap the, the beetles. Um, they also have something called Swiffer pads you can use on the right-hand side. Um, and then also there's chemical control. So there are pesticides if, if you want to use them and the commonly used one is check mite for small hive beetle. Okay, so that was somewhat of an overview. If you want to learn a lot more from one of the resident experts or volunteers that we have teaching, uh, there's a pest and disease ID lecture, and that should be on the website along with all the other lectures within a week. Um, but this was just somewhat of a overview and a little introduction to uh, the four Ps. Uh, so thank you for your time. And I'll put the links in the chat. And I appreciate um, Janine and John that have been working very closely with the California Master Beekeeper Program to take the curriculum to the next level and uh, make it applicable for people in Northern California as well. And um, you can always reach us at the email on our website if you're interested. And uh, thank you, Eric and Hank, for uh, setting this up. Awesome, thank you. So we've got some questions in the in the chat. Do you do you want to just uh, look at the chat and read them oh, out? Yeah, I'll check it out. Okay, okay let's do this. Uh, so journeyman level, you learn to graft queens, correct? That's correct. Yes. Um, and actually on their website, there's a, a large detailed list of what you learn at each level of the certification staff, if you want to go check there too. Uh, I see Dickel George, what is the current LA legal status of oxalic acid vaporization and dribble? Uh, what can we expect in the future? Good question. So it's still uh, illegal, oxalic acid. Um, I mean, there's not like that much money in it. So that's why I think in many cases it's not being is not being legalized at the state because it's not like a company is lobbying for oxalic acid to be legalized. But maybe that, that could be something that um, we do as a community to, to lobby to get that legalized. But there's still being researched on it. And I need to say that it's still illegal in the state of California, so you, you cannot use it. Um, it is being done. Uh, there's some research being done on it in California, though, if you get permits. Um, what is the current California requirements for buying larger amounts of for Pro and Apicard. So that question I don't have the answer to, unfortunately, but I can keep a log of this chat. Um, if I don't know who has control of the meeting after, but if someone could send me the chat, I'd appreciate I'll it. I'll send it to you. Thank you very much. I can get yep. a proper answer to, to that question. Um, and what are the expectations of volunteer public service upon completion of the master beekeeping program? 10 hours a year? Good question. So yeah, it's around 10 hours a year, but it depends on the level. So the, the further levels expect, uh, we expect a little bit more, um, but that is also under our, our website. If you go onto the certifications tab and click on Bs and Cs, then it will talk about that. And Bs and Cs, so Bs stand for beneficial educational experience and Cs is continuing education. So there's some requirements for volunteering and for continuing education every year to maintain your certification. And that's on the website. Uh, now they have a vaccine for AFB. How is that? 
Oh yeah, I heard about it. How is that being applied to pathogen prevention or is the vaccine just for commercial operations? Uh, I unfortunately don't have the answer to that one, uh, but thank you for asking and I will get an answer. Should bees captured for pesticide analysis be stored on ice? Uh, you could do that. Yeah, because you don't want them to, to break down. Yeah, that would be a good idea. Uh, gross. How common is AFB in Northern California? Maybe that uh, that question is better for Eric. Do you know how common it is in Northern California? Or any, maybe anybody else in the, in the oh, Zoom uh, would have? Dick here. Um, I think Janine would agree, and probably Eric. We get a, a case or two every year. That's about it. Yep. Sorry, I, I was muted and I was talking. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, John says EFP can be ropey, just not as far. It doesn't snap back. Okay, thank you for that, John. Um, and then EFP says when you say burn all equipment, do you mean all the hives in the apiary or just the ones with symptoms? What about honey supers? What about boxes? Is singeing boxes no longer recommended? Um, so so burning all equipment is all the hives in the apiary that could have possibly been exposed. When I say apiary, it's like all the hives. Uh, I mean, if you have hives far enough from each other, I think it's fine, but um, I don't know the exact legal. I, um, yeah, do you have- I can answer? add on that. We had yeah, a, a case here in Northern California. We had a case and we worked with David Giuliano. He's our ag inspector. There's a procedure is that you burn the hive that's infected and then the, um, the rest of the apiary goes into quarantine and you treat it with teramycin in the spring and in the fall and you got to monitor it all along. So you, it's in the, in the quarantine until uh, total season and you got to treat it in the spring and the fall with teramycin. But you only need to get rid of the actual uh, hive that's infected. And, that, and we have set up a procedure here in Humboldt County where the AC, David Giuliani will contact the Eureka Fire Department, they will burn it. I think that includes your honey supers as well, Dick. Okay. And, yep. you know, it is a reportable infection. So you have to notify the Ag Department. Oh yeah, um, well, it could definitely be spores in the honey supers. That's why you don't feed your honey supers back to your bees. If yeah. You and oh. uh, as far as AFB, it's not harmful for humans to consume the honey, but extreme care needs to be taken if a beekeeper chooses to harvest the honey that it not be in any part, you know, crushed and extracted in a place where you don't want it to ever come in contact with honeybees since those mm -hmm. spores live for 75 plus years. You know, one of, one of the things that I've always been conflicted about is they tell you to treat it with teramycin, yet they turn around and tell you AFB is resistant to teramycin. So it, it just seems counterintuitive to me to, that you would want to do that. And you, you need to step up to a, a different antibiotic if, if you're going to try and treat your other colonies to keep them from coming down with AFB. Well, I think Beltsville, the reason that you send a specimen to them, they will tell you if you're, what antibiotics um, are going to work for the type of AFB you have. They do the further testing. And it takes... Yeah. A long time, but yeah, that's the problem. It, will, it will come back, and that will help for the future treatments. So anyway, I did write down a few things about AFB and how David Giuliano um, can help beekeepers because we have worked with him, and he has become quite uh, familiar with how to help beekeepers if this occurs. If I, if I might add is that in the 
in our uh, next meeting, uh, I have invited Dave Giuliano to give a brief overview of what the procedure is here in Humboldt County. If someone has uh, American fowl brood in their colony in the apiary. So hopefully he will give a short presentation because we do have a veterinarian that will uh, uh, prescribe the medication and we have a procedure how to get rid of the hive. So what about the uh, singeing of boxes question? It's like, do you really want to take a chance? Well, no, I'm asking about the requirements. It, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, it, you know, I'm I'm asking, um, uh, well, I'm asking Nickad because he's saying burn all the boxes, cap all the equipment, capital letters. I mean, equipment could include gloves, hat, shoes, whatever. So I'm thinking, what is what is, what does he think the limit is here? I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, the books say you can singe the boxes. You're saying all. So what what are you what's what what's you say, really correct? You say the book. Are you what? talking about? When, you, when you're saying the book, you're talking about honeybee oh, biology. Not, no, books books in general, of which I have like several feet of on the shelf, say, you know, A, B, C, X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. In fact, the um, um, Pests and Diseases Guide 2016 talks about uh, shaking the bees off and, uh, um, you know, starting them up again and just burning the frames which I don't think any of us really recommend doing that. So what about this singeing the boxes thing? Let's at least see what you think about that. Uh, well, the singeing the boxes, uh, I can't comment on, but in terms of the like the limit of what the equipment is, I mean, your your gloves are, they go either way, but your uh, suit, if you have a suit, you definitely should wash that. I don't think you need to completely destroy that. Um, but again, I will check to get an answer from our resident uh, researcher, Alina Nino, um, on the Sinjin question. Yeah, yeah. It was standard, that was the standard thing in the past. And so anyway, you get the idea. Hey, Dick. So yeah. if you're required by law to burn all your, burn the colony, everything in it, yeah, there shouldn't be anything to singe, right? Well, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's to death, right, at that point. We're, we're, not, we're not actually reading the law here. So I guess my question might be, what does the law actually say? Yeah, we'd have to dig that not out. What are, what, not what are our opinions, but what does the law actually say? That would be good to know since. Yeah, and, and it's kind of vague in there because the last time I read it, it's been a over a year. They well, I read it this past year. Of course, I can't remember the exact wording, but the the yeah. truth is, you know, if it were me, I would say burn the boxes and I'm throwing the gloves in the fire too. Yeah, I, I would I would say and the saucer use... and the hive tools. <laughs> if Everything you're gonna use... getting burned. <laughs> If you're using used equipment that with unknown history, you know, uh, probably shouldn't use it. If you have some stuff you're not sure about, maybe that's when you do singeing, I think. And then if you read that Canadian uh, pest and diseases, they actually say 10% Clorox can, can kill AFB spores. Well, we don't live in Canada, so <laughs> you have to do what they say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that leads to my next question, which is about alcohol, because that's the first I ever heard that alcohol could kill F AFV spores. No, uh, yeah, alcohol is a terrible surface disinfectant. You know, when I was, was in dental school, we'd clean all our instruments with alcohol. But then this nifty little disease called AIDS came along and alcohol went out the window. You know, yeah, it's a terrible surface disinfectant. Well, that's might, a risk, but I wouldn't rely on. It. And, and this is a this is a spore of a bacteria, so it seems like there should just be uh, very clear scientific data. Does alcohol kill AFB spores? I mean, people have been thinking about this for seventy five years. That's your master capstone right there. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I'm sure it's already been figured out. I mean, it's an obvious question for a long time. And, and the books, um, you know, of which I'm referring to in the general sense, say that the only thing that kills them are flames, radiation, and boiling in lye. And so if alcohol could do it, well, that would have been known a long time ago. Same yeah. for uh, same for bleach. Right. Okay. Well, well, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. It must already be obvious to people who study these things. Uh, and Mary Bensinger sent the uh, the California code on AFB. It's it's on, yeah, it's on the screen also. It's pretty short. Yeah, yeah burn it all. But if you get the other ways, they, they, they talk about uh, if you go below, I think there's it starts to get a little more nebulous. Yeah, that's not the one. If bleach and alcohol don't work, I would think you'd have to burn your soup too. Well, you see, there's see, it's the spores, and also, you know, if you have a good case of that in your in your uh, in, say one hive has obvious foul brood, and usually people don't catch it until it's pretty far along. I mean, uh, you know, drifting happenings all the time. I mean, there's no way that all the all the uh, colonies are not going to be exposed, but it, it is a fact that all your colonies will not actually get it. Um, but I'd like to add to that. So it's, it's like what we're saying here is that it, 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 there's no strict, obvious barrier for uh, keeping this under control. You just have to stop somewhere. I'm okay. really glad that Marla Spivak worked with our um, California queen breeders to help uh, in, you know, rearing um, hygienic queens <clears throat> so that we have bees that, that um, if they have good hygienic behavior, will pull out the larvae before <clears throat> there's an infection that can take place. Um, is that, does hygienic behavior actually, let's see, I'm looking up in the- Read item B in, these, in this uh, universal citations about burning and scorching. Tell me what you think. Um, okay, let's see. Yeah, on the, on the subject of burning hives, uh, I had acquired a big stack of uh, used hives that have been sitting in a, an orchard for uh, about seven years unused, and they were completely infested with waxworm. Completely different animal, I know, but I took the frames apart, literally took them apart and scraped out every little nook and cranny, pulled all the little holes out, soaked all the little parts in bleach water, put them back together, and it didn't kill them. I mean, it, there's nooks and crannies and frames that are just really difficult. I could see a few spores getting away from that. Now, things like suits and gloves, I think, could be laundered in a solution that would get around every fiber and you'd be able to reach all the spores. But uh, I was really surprised. But even with the very dramatic work of trying to tear apart a hive and 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 the frames, I couldn't get all the waxworms out. They They came back. So there was, uh, and I can see where if you've got a highly infectious disease, I, I you know, and if it, if it if they're in a little bubble someplace, somewhere in a corner, you're just not going to get. It's better off just burning it, you know, start fresh. No. Do you mean wax moths or wax? Is that is that what you uh, mean? Wax worms, yeah, the moths, the the larva. They were. Uh, they, they don't they, come spores. But what I'm saying is, is it's the nooks and crannies in in the wood. Oh, yeah provide these little hiding spots the spores can get into that may not be reached by bleach. So you may think you're treating everything because our big fat fingers can, you know, you know, scrub it all, all, all I think, at once. I think you got get reinfected. Every little hole. I think it got reinfected. Yeah. I think I mean, uh, bleach is gonna take those worms out, but they're they're prevalent there. Well there's 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 the little issue of the uh the, the cocoons are somewhat waterproof. And, uh, you know, I was trying to tear everything open and get it into every little nook and cranny, but I was really surprised at how minuscule, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, not all the frames 
you know, had that. But out of all of the frames that I had, 50 frames, I, I, I probably had three or four of them still infected after a substantial amount of work. So I was, oh. uh, I could see, sort of see if you're dealing with something as deadly as American Falcon, you really just better off burning it. Now, oh. with cloths and things, you know, things you can get into the, the every, every fiber, you know, soaking uh, oh. tools that don't have heavy wooden handles with like, uh, you know, spaces underneath between the wood uh, interfaces between wooden and, and metal or uh, gloves, things you can put in laundry. I think they, they could be much better saturated and, and affected. Well, let's, uh, let's keep going down these questions and we'll we'll pick up this conversation so we don't have um, a can here all night. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Ken. That was really an interesting lecture. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Yeah, and I'm, I'm learning all the time, right? I started a year ago, and uh, I know many people in this call, like people have been teaching for like 20 plus years. So um, this is a great group. This, these people are knowledgeable. I'm, I'm super happy to be with them. Yeah, I think um, most of the other ones, okay. The other ones I will I will check with, with the expert, as I mentioned, uh, Elena, our research director, and I will provide provide the answers and probably by by one week we um, all get that i'll get the uh question trans tra i appreciate transfer. that yeah. thank yeah. you eric yeah awesome. i want to see who wins this uh competition i'll stay and watch <laughs> so, you know um let me say one thing as long as we did get started